hello. I always say my name is Richard Miller. You might know that. Uh, this is never not here. You might know that, you know, but if you don't, uh, it is. And uh, I'm in Australia and I'm discovering a new continent, a new country, a new people, and uh, some new ideas. And, uh, and I suppose it comes from the fact that uh, I have a belief that as a human we can, we can make sense. And uh, we know as a human we can make mischief and hang on to erroneous beliefs. We know we can do that. And somehow, somewhere I must think that we can also shed some erroneous beliefs and just make sense and simplify everything. And uh, so I'm going to talk with, we're going to talk with Howard Cook. And uh, thanks for coming. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Howie. Howie. Although my mom would be proud of you calling me Howie. Oh yeah, <laughs> I try to give everyone you know the good, the real uh, yeah. Uh, formal. Yeah, that's fine. And we're mm -hmm. meeting for the first time. I've, uh, yeah, I've been thrown in the deep end, so it's yeah, kind cool, of fun. Huh? Yeah, it's cool. This is really fun, right? Mm. So then, I mean, is it possible? Can we uh, something in our lives uh, was really befuddling, and then later it got to be simple. So then, some kind of sense prevailed, right? Mm. And then. Um, I entirely think it's possible. I mean, it has to be possible. That's the the reality. Is if we don't get that uh, um, together, then we're in trouble because this this complicated and mischievous. It's a nice way to put it. Mischievous. It's often a lot worse than um, mischief, isn't it? But uh, we have to find our way back to simplicity. It's a key to the whole thing of how we um, exist. Uh, successfully on this planet. It's really interesting and I do like to say mischief because I think part of the mischief is just turning your head away from what's happening. Yeah. And we've done that so much, you know, because we yeah. believe we're insulated. We've got the armies, we've got the navies, we've got the border patrol, we've got the gated community, we've got the high tra tax structure, we've got the citizenship papers, we've got all these things that somehow we believe that we don't have to look around. We just don't have to. Well, as individuals, we don't have those things. And we, we, when we look at it, that's not how we want to live our lives in a, in a gated prison, you know, in living in fear and all the rest of it. As individuals, we, uh, I believe in the goodness of humans and that we actually do want to live surrounded by nature, friends, you know, um, and, and, and goodness of spirit with each other so that we don't require all these things. Um, and certainly in, in my I have I sort of lead a double life. One as an artist, as a painter, and the other as uh, working in marine conservation, and working in the marine environment. And I found a lot of things uh, that have worked successfully that that I've initiated or um, you know obsessed about uh, have been very successful when they've been extremely simple. When they come from a point of view of just straightforward logic, common logic, the way. And people just go, well, you know, it's logical, isn't it? Or it's, it's obvious. But a lot of the time people don't act. They do exactly what you're talking about. They assume someone else over there with more authority, so-called, someone who's more of an expert, will enact the logical, simple uh, solutions to things. And clearly what we see is that doesn't happen. And a lot of the times, I mean, right now in Australia, we live in a time of politicians who are afraid to do anything of any significance because they care about polls, they care about uh, not being seen to do the wrong thing. And so we just have this befuddled, uninspired sort of leadership in, in that sort of level. Well, it just reflects us. We're befuddled and uninspired. So many of us, you know, <laughs> so many of us have, have, can remember that we were that way, you mm. know, and maybe we can say we're coming out of it now. Let's have a coming out of it party. And I was saying that we have all those protection devices, and we were thinking that that meant that we were insulated, you know, that someone else had... Had, yeah. had separated us from anything that could hurt us or harm us, and then we could just live this blind life, and then we could just uh, give up yeah. our uh, our our responsibility yeah, for anything, crazy. you know. And somehow, with luck, here we are alive in a time when uh, it seems like we're at risk. It seems like that in this non-responsibility and, and averting our gaze and uh, depriving our attention from so many things in the world. And allowing that uh, playing a numbness game, you know, like yeah. how much can we just get diverted into televisions and games and 
and trips and uh, yep. you know we thought that that was like the meaning of life was there and uh, we're so lucky that I think that this is proving not working yeah it's true it's everything um, represents as an opportunity doesn't it if if something's not going down the prescribed path of uh, comfortability <laughs> if we get pushed and challenged that, that always represents an opportunity and and traditionally uh, humankind have risen to the challenge. You know, we've we've had different ages of uh, pioneering, inventiveness, <coughs> sharing. You know, flourishing of the arts, all that kind of stuff. And um, we we aspire to goodness, I believe. You know, we aspire to excel and aspire to um, share and help each other. And somewhere along the way, we get derailed as a whole species. We get derailed with, uh, and it seems it, it obviously moves around. The, the the appearance of fear in the form of war and and you know uh, human disrespect for not only e themselves and each other but for also uh, other sentient beings on the planet and but all the time there is this rising I believe of human human consciousness it's just it's become to a point it's come to a point where we wonder if there's an there's enough uh, and I'm sure there is, but it, it, you know, we live in a time when the actual resources are being so stretched to a limit, the environment's stressed to the maximum, and we've got, uh, you know, rising population and so forth. We've got more and more natural disasters. We're wondering, <clears throat> can we make the next consciousness lift to those things we aspire to without the whole floor dropping away from underneath us? How so? Why do you, why do you say that? Why would the floor drop away? Uh... Oh, you mean the, the floor dropping away is the stimulus to make the con the next uh, jump in consciousness? Um, or what I'm meaning is that we've we've lived in, in a longer sort of geological terms. We've lived in relatively stable times, and and there's always been uh, you know earthquakes and volcanoes and, and natural disasters, but everything seems to be compounded. Perhaps because partly partly because of the internet and so forth. Our our we now live in this one big global village. And Just because we know about it, in other words. We know we're about informed. what's happening with our friends in another country who we've never met. We, our brothers and sisters in these other places are alerting us to stress their fear or they're in court in the fear par paradigms themselves of being oppressed by their own government or that sort of thing, by their own people. And Whereas before, things could be hidden away more. Now we're so sort of aware of everything that all of these things are coming together at the same time. And certainly making people have a sense of anxiety. You know, yeah. Will we get through? Will, will so, so much of the world or the, the institutions are a confidence game, right? And even yeah. life is a confidence game because now we're having, uh, we're, lack, uh, we're losing confidence that the planet can support us, that there's not That's global I mean. warming, that there's not some kind of a excess uh, um, uh, uh, natural disasters. And uh, yeah. so then our whole confidence about our, our lifestyle is just shaken. And that's why we need to move strongly into our hearts and remain in, uh, in, in that kind of space, in that kind of thing of knowing that the things that really give us pain is when we hurt another fellow feeling sentient being. You know, when we, however we do that through our actions. And so we have to always be aware of that, paying attention to that. And if we are moving, in, trying to be in our hearts and be with compassion, and we can push back fear and help each other. And all the other stuff, you know, what we might uh, create around us or what we might be able to dismantle as well, will come about through that thing of sharing and through heart connection. It's not going to come through political systems. It's not going to come through fascist regimes and totalitarian. It's going Won't to there be a political system that will, will be the outcropping of this heart? I mean, it will be put down in an institution somehow. It has to be institutionalized, doesn't it? We can't just count on every man being a, a righteous man. And then is, would there be a we, critical mass or something <laughs> like that? Or how would it work? Does every last well, being it, have to somehow be awakened? In a way, the, we have to break through that, that thing of being children, expecting, accepting the idea that a, a more adult, a more expert, a more authoritarian uh, regime will sort it out for us. A religion, a religion is a classic one, a classic example of like people just going, okay, you just sort it all out for me. Tell me what to do, and I'll do it, and then everything will be okay. And it, that I, I do have more faith in the idea of less 
uh, interference of state, politicians, religion, all the rest of it, all that moving back, and the rise of individuals all having heart opening, heart awakening, and realizing that we can uh, change a lot of uh, values that have either been superimposed upon us, that we've accepted, and go to core values, go to the real values of what it is to be human, to be humane, and to have humanity, and that we can all start to 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 feel that as individuals, mm -hmm. and we will bring about we will, we would bring about then, you know, a new paradigm. Yeah. The other, the other, other. Well, the old paradigm. I like to say a few more things about it because it's so patriarchal and so much. We are we're hero worshippers, and even when you said we've risen to challenges before, but you know, who rose to the challenges? A Churchill or somebody like that. The leaders rose to the challenge. Sure, they inspired us, and we plodded along and and fought the Second World War or whatever, you know. But I mean, uh, we're even now the New Agers. They got extraterrestrials that are going to come down, and they got villages underground, and yeah. they got. Uh, uh, you know they've got mm. the council of the of the angels, and we're always looking for a patriarch to, to pull us out of the fire, right? Yeah. And there's Jesus, of course, and well, perhaps and we're looking for a matriarch, but whatever. Either one. W either way, it it it's clear it's clear that we're in in a, in a place where we need to take responsibility as individuals, you know, and recognize that we're part of this whole humanity, and more that we're part of this whole biosphere and we can't separate ourselves all the time and we can't expect someone else to 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 take control of 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 things that we could manage ourselves right in a way that's exactly what i'm doing but the way i'm doing it is i want to put these things on the table mm. so i want to take all the stuff under the rug and put it up on the table sure. and say look i'm not going to tell i'm not going to declare about this i'm not going to say this is right this is wrong mm. i'm going to say you can see it feel it and uh, and you decide, right? Yeah. But I mean, there is another step to it because you're talking about any time we try it on another person, you know, this is this is core, and this is where we can go to the core. But the pain of that, I believe, we don't know how to handle it, you know, and we don't know what to do with that pain. And maybe I want to also coach and counsel and put on the table that you don't have to do anything with it. Just start by acknowledging it, mm. right? Because once you take it out from under the rug, well. The rug, what is the rug? The rug is our collective numbness. Yeah. And our numbness m makes us n not human, basically not responsible and not human. Mm. And, we're, and we're addicted to that numbness because of the pain of the world, right? And because of how heavy-footed the Western w uh, world, the Western societies are, we tromp around with these number 10 army boots and the world, and, and we know we call it collateral damage, right? It's just yeah. too bad, you know? But we were getting the bad guys, too. Yeah, yeah. It's. It, I mean, I hear exactly what you're saying. Uh, I, I'm an active Sea Shepherd crew member, you know, and there's um, the whole thing about direct action, you know, taking that initiative, even when there are voices raised, you know, saying this is eco terrorism or this is terrorism or uh, you guys are doing it the wrong way. You know, you're you're getting in the way of negotiations that are going on at the International Whaling Commission. I've had 35 years of being involved in particular with the issue of whale and dolphin protection. And um, there's always going to be that paradox that Sea Shepherd has to use direct action and confronting techniques and block, blocking and ramming actions, uh, whaling ships, and using fuel to get down to the Antarctic to do that, you know, burning um, uh, uh, thousands of tons of fuel to, to fight for whales. So you know, there's this kind of people can pinpoint things and there's always going to be these trade-offs. One of the things we struggle with is how do we trade off, you know, like uh, um, all the issues of food and how far food travels and all those kind of things. We're, we're in this age where everything's coming down to those kind of looking at, at our responsibility and our footprint. But it's worth doing. Like I say, it's worth putting on the table. Yeah, so you're just putting it on the table. You're not going to stop every whaler, but you're going to put it on the table and maybe yeah. you'll get some... In what I said, institutions. Some institutions are going to pass, say, we don't want to do any whaling in this ocean, you know, and uh, well, we, we want to get uh, nations to sign on to this, right? Well, we have this institution in the, in the name of the International Whaling Commission. I mean, it's an unfortunate name. It's, a, it's, a, it's unfortunate. It's not the International Whale Celebration Commission or something. And its whole premise from the outset was to deal with the issue of whaling and how to sustain whaling as a future food or, you know, industry. 
So but, not to deplete the whales, but not to save them necessarily, but just take a uh, column just uh, uh, as they can future, support. Future, future resource. How to maintain it as a future resource. I mean, you know, the issue of bluefin tuna has come up where it appears that the premise there of Japan is to make the bluefin tuna extinct and stockpile them and then be able to sell the bluefin tuna back onto the market at, a, at any price they care to name. A million dollars a fish. I mean, right now, $150,000 for a fish. So why not, in their viewpoint? The, the, the thing with International Whaling Commission is that there are these things that have been instituted and then are flagrantly ignored because the International Whaling Commission has no teeth. So then you have an organization like Sea Shepherd, which has sunk 11 whaling ships, going and taking direct action on behalf of whales. And How so, the hell do you do that? Sink a ship? You mean you shoot at it? No, Sea Shepherd has sunk, uh, I believe, if it's five five ships with limpet mines and, and six by undoing the seacocks and sinking them in the harbours. Oh. There's been no loss of life, no one on board. The first ship that Sea Shepherd ran, there were people on board. It was 1979, the first Paul Watson um, initiated the seriousness of what he was about to embark upon by ramming and cutting holes through a, an illegal whaling ship which later on he sunk with limpet mines when there was no one on board, sunk it properly. He's also sunk one of his own ships when, when the authorities were saying, OK, we're going to take your ship and give it to whalers. So he sent saboteurs and sunk one of his own ships so that they couldn't have his ship, which had been impounded. But, but, but what I'm saying is I love to see the courage and the dedication of Paul Watson, who has actually directly saved hundreds of thousands of of whales, dolphins, and sharks, bluefin tuna, and, and albatross by direct in intervention. You know, and I worked alongside him in the Antarctic and, and I've been in, in Mediterranean undercover operation in the Faroe Islands. That's a good example. Here you've got people herding in every single pilot whale they can and killing them, slashing them to death, and then taking their bodies and chopping them up and dropping them off cliffs from trucks back down a ravine. And this is one of the most comfortable, most well-off places in Europe. They got they they well supported by Denmark and all this. But and we that's went, just that game that they play, or that's the a, contest, or it's a sport. It's just a bloodlust, a patriarchal bloodlusting, bloodletting, and completely at odds with the age we live in now, where we keep on talking about the importance of biodiversity and the global village and the sentient social intelligence of whales and dolphins and the recognition that actually this is planet ocean not planet earth and we have a lot of arrogance to say man and the likeness of god and god stands in domin dominion over animals and so forth when clearly this is an oceanic planet and we're lucky that we've got these little rocky outcrops that will give us the privilege of being in the company of this extremely noble compassionate race of people called whales and dolphins and their other friends you know the the marine mammals and the sharks and so forth. So we'd been there. I was there on a sea ship operation where we found one of the graveyards where they'd killed 84 pilot whales in seven minutes, this sharp knives, 400 people going crazy. And we found the whales, they'd dumped them off the cliff. Last This is last year. And raised two decapitated heads in a baby whale's tail. I mean, I hurled, it was me who was handling these body parts and the, the tail of the whale was only this wide. It's supposed to be as wide as this room, you know. And these people have internet, TV, they have 3,000 euros per person per month given to them by Denmark so they won't you know, go back to Norway because it's all about oil and gas exploration leases. And, and you see the corruption and you see that humans will keep on enacting these crazy things in the name of tradition and culture mm. in an age when we ought to say, let's just take the best things of tradition and culture and share with each other. Right. Yeah. This is only the tip. This is not even the tip of the iceberg, really. This is some kind of anomaly, right? And it's in a no. This is not an anomaly. This, no. This this is an unfortunate aspect of humans. And if it's not the Faroe Islands, then it's Solomon yeah. Islands with slaughtering dolphins. Japanese killing twenty four thousand yeah. dolphins every year in Japan. I've paddled out in that cove. You know, we've twenty two of us on surfboard paddled out in that killing cove in Japan. And we stopped them killing dolphins for 10 days. And they attacked us and everything else like that. But it was to their detriment that we were non-violent action. And they attacked us. And it was caught by CNN. It was put out around the world. And now it's in a movie called The Cove. And another movie called Minds in the Water. For all to see and make up their own mind where the, where the truth really lies. 
So, you know, I'm a, I'm a big fan, actually, of uh, the power of the camera. Yeah, no, <laughs> the power of the doing. camera is what I love, you know. Yeah. And, but I'm not quite so uh, brave to get out on the ocean and uh, with my cameras and, and well, you might face be. off. Maybe might, I will. You, you know? might have an epiphany about tigers or rhinos or, you know, some people living in the dark or somewhere that you feel you need to go and help. And the camera will be an important part of it. Yeah, the camera is so interesting. YouTube. I think YouTube ought to be, uh, you know, somehow uh, written in the Bill of Rights or something like that, right? Because if the YouTube ever went down, I don't know. What if the old internet and YouTube, yeah, they, that's just what's shining a light on all of this, uh, you know, darkness. And, and and when I talk about that, you know, I must say I take hope because, you know, I do a lot of, I've been involved in a lot of things that can, could make me very cynical. And there is a certain aspect to me that says, when certain things are going on, when I look at the whole picture, we're doomed. We're kind of doomed. Uh, humans will have to experience a massive die-off. We will have to experience the repercussions of our stressing the planet. It's inevitable. It's just inevitable. It doesn't mean that the entire human species will disappear, but we, we, we will leave behind, uh, when we go through these big shake-ups, humans who are much more conscious about what it means not to take responsibility, not to uh, <clears throat> agree to always think ahead seven gen generations to see what is best care practice for the planet. There will be people in the future who will go, yeah. best care. I don't know. We can't even understand what's good for seven years ahead, how about, much less seven generations yeah. or one generation. We're not looking at all at one generation. Well, that's, And that's the neat part about Occupy, that the young people are going to take that and run with it because like they're... They're the ones that are on the spot. They're the ones that are inheriting a, mm. a pile of rubble as far as a uh, society, and uh, with no steering wheels and no, uh, you know, but infinite no breaks. possibilities and infinite opportunity and you yeah. know, challenges that are worthy. So somehow they have to take responsibility, and somehow they have yeah. to work in consort and and, mm. and, and, and and with each other, and somehow they have to make yep. some kind of basic agreements that you said uh, in Australia, certainly in America. I mean, like uh, in the U.S. Senate is all about just blocking. That's all they can yeah. do is block stuff. Nothing yeah. goes. Like the International Whaling Commission, Japan, Norway, Iceland, Denmark, they sit there going, no, no, no. You know, and then and paying off all their all these other countries who will vote with them just foreign aid and all this, but just to say no, no, mm -hmm. and create stalemates. And well, what's the point of that? You know, like I, I, I have been obviously I'm part of this in around here what's known as the rainbow tribe you know this culture and um, we're not so evident now and we're not elitist or exclusive we're just, it's just a general term of a description for neo-tribalism and the idea that we should be talking about everything from little things to big issues that that anything that's causing sort of some sort of stress within community and the way that the way that rainbow tribe has always functioned is to have circle and that the talking stick passes to each person each person speaks and is not interrupted and is heard and doesn't doesn't i went once i went to a rainbow festival uh in in the early in 84 i think it was in spokane the one in the u.s anyhow mm -hmm. i don't know what you guys do out here and yeah i saw the talking stick and all that stuff and it was pretty amazing and i met a rainbow guy just uh this year at the at uh, Occupy, you know, and he was mm. telling me what they do, what's happening now, and I probably had a misperception of the whole thing, thinking it was much more organized, and maybe it's just spontaneous. I don't see it. It's not organized. It's just it's just a general movement that moves around the world, you know, f finding new places to, to, to be, to spend time, you know, with people you feel that comfortable with because they ho occupy a similar mind space. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of Occupy. I think that's fabulous. Uh, when we were traveling recently, just uh, just come back from California, and we were sailing these sailing Hobies down the coast there and meeting with Californian community and giving them a platform to speak about the issues that they had on their coast. Because with my group, Surfers for Cetaceans, we are the voice for the international surf community against the killing of whales and dolphins. And we have brought the surf media to the story. Like the surf media has always ignored it. But finally, we've brought the story where they have to speak up for our brothers and sisters in the sea and our favorite surfers, the dolphins, and so on. And, you know, we were traveling down the coast and the Occupy movement had started roughly the same time that we started our trip. And it was like, we were hearing about it. And, well, it's really interesting. This thing over on Wall Street. And Michael Franny's there, you know. And, and there's all sorts of stuff going on. And, and then we could hear more and more. And by the time we got halfway down California, I made a five foot by five banner which we 
was put onto a bamboo pole and then at 4.30 in the morning went out and we zip tied it to the cart of Kook, you know, that, that surfer is made out of bronze at, at Cardiff there, just south of Encinitas, he's surfing like this and he's known as the cart of Kook. People regularly dress him up in women's clothes and stuff. And there was the sign facing all traffic going north towards LA and it said, unoccupy the sea, wipe out, surf term, world, whaling worldwide, wipe out whaling worldwide, which is one of my little sayings. And and I initiated this unoccupy because what concerned me about occupy was that to see a guy holding up a sign in Alaska saying, occupy the tundra. I was like, no, don't occupy the tundra. There's too many humans and too many wild yeah, places. Yeah, nice from the tundra, right? So I'm hoping unoccupy will also <laughs> run, will run yeah. in parallel with occupy. Yeah. Right. Because cool. some places that, that there shouldn't be humans and there's definitely too many fishing boats by at least 10 times, 12 times. So we should unoccupy and remove ourselves and dismantle some of the, the machine that we've created. Let me ask you something, because I think we touched on it, you know, I think it's really important, and I think it's really empowering, but what I want to say is that, I, if I go real basic, I'll just say that um, every time we have a thought or a pattern of thoughts or a belief or a discovery, mm. it's accompanied in our body by a feeling and a, a contraction yeah. and by a mood and by you know, and, and it's supported and, and held in place by a uh, interpretation and a belief, yeah. and uh, you know, and uh, actually a, an oath. We kind of swear an oath never again, or I won't do this, or I'm always gonna. I mean, there's so many things that happen, you know, and everything that comes in the peoples, right, and somehow yeah. is perceived, it has a ricochet effect that just goes and yeah. makes a feeling, right? Yeah. And okay, so then. Uh, you know, for so long the spiritual movements or the new age was about having positive thoughts, mm. right? And one way to do it away is kind of blank out from negative thoughts, right? Or step away from them, right? Or not paying attention to them or just say, look, these guys worry a lot, but I'm, yeah. I'm not ever sucked into that or ever or not so often, right? And so then sometimes we've experimented with that and we've said, like, uh, when I kind of have uh, less anxiety, um, I create a better life for myself. Yeah, I think because when I have less anxiety, I mean, tomorrow I'll probably have less anxiety too. But if I have a huge anxiety tomorrow, how is it going to just shift? I'm trying to get it to shift, right? Yep. I'm trying to open my body, right, and my energies. Mm -hmm. But when I'm squeezing, like anxious is squeezing, right? And then nothing in my health works right, but nothing in my aura works right. Nothing in my reflection of people works right. People that come to me don't feel good. And all the programs that I work on probably get bogged down, right, in this in this black ink that I'm uh, that I'm immersing myself in and how can you help it because I mean it, it is a real feeling you know because you just otherwise it wouldn't be a movie industry if you couldn't get a feeling out of a justice situation or something <laughs> like that and you're working on a justice situation you said a lot of people can get closed hearted about it but you started saying that the whole point is to work in our heart center and to move to our yeah. heart center right and so then, in a way, it's not really working for a lot of people because they're trying to uh, get on an issue that's really felt, you know, because there's really some terrible things that are happening for senseless reasons, you know, mm -hmm. when you talk about these killings are just for sport or bloodlust or whatever. Uh, and nobody will really back up. Or, you know, there's so many interests going on, and you're saying the politicians are, are running this, this fine line of do nothing because no matter what they do, someone's going to beat them on the head with it, right? Mm -hmm. And so then, uh, and we're saying the creative space spiritually is always kind of like an open and a vast space. And that actually space, just uh, the, the emptiness is where everything can happen. We said that just in our discussion because I said we're inheriting, the kids are inheriting an unworkable world. And you're saying, but they have all the possibilities. Mm. Right? So that comes out of the space, mm. the space of that world that somehow if you can notice it, you know, you don't have to create it. The space is already here. But I mean, if you clog it up with ideas of justice and injustice, which are true too, I'm not saying don't notice them. I was saying put them up on the table and then to feel them because we don't know what to do with world pain. We don't know what to do with injustice, you know, and we think we can fight it, you know, but I mean, uh, the whole world is fighting, right? Fighting this and they're fighting for this and I'm fighting against this and they're fighting. Why are they fighting for whaling or anything else? You know, they're fighting because they think that some guys depend on that for work and their jobs and their economic security and whatnot. You know, I mean, if nobody was a forester, there was no loggers around, they wouldn't cut down any trees, right? Mm. 
Mm. And they would just say, well, we'd all be counting the birds or something like that. So then how, I mean, what are we going to do? I mean, like, how can you integrate that? Or how can there be a softer way to approach that? Or how can it be without such a war? Because we have the war on poverty, the war on drugs, the war on, on, on terrorism. You know, we have at least everything is categorized as a war on something, you know. And then it feels like it's real because that's how we, how we, how we believe that, uh, that the world is good and evil, that there's a Jesus, but there's also a devil. You know, if there was no devil, there'd be no need for a Jesus, right? And so then we don't even have, we wouldn't even have a need for a good guy if there was no evil guys. So then the whole thing is an insidious kind of like turnaround or like, you know, it's, it's, it, I think you need to be cognizant of that, you know, when yeah. you're, when you're fighting for a cause. And I don't know, how do you handle that and what, how does that come up for you? It comes up for me. It comes it definitely, and but um, I'm like I said before. I'm also an artist, a painter, and I immerse myself in symbolism and celebration as an artist. You know, celebrating beauty and thing. And as as an artist, you are a politician. You know, you're putting forward your view of the world, and you'd like people to to uh, relate to it and so forth. Sometimes what I do is hardcore in the form of using cartoons and all the rest of it. But uh, I remember when I first started out painting whales in the mid seventies, that and having an epiphany about whales, and going, all right, how much of what I'm going to do is save the whales, and how much of it is going to be love the whales? And very much was very clear there at 19 years old, it's going to be love the whales. And when when I'm in, been involved with Sea Shepherd, where we're a vegan operation that's showing compassion for animals, doing direct action but never have caused any harm to anybody, never you know, caused loss of life. It's about blockading and helping the whales. It's, it's, the focus is on the whales. When people try to come at Sea Shepherd or surface visitations talking about the culture of, of you know, talking about interfering with Japanese culture, for example, or Norwegian culture, my response to that is always, we are working for dolphin culture. We're working for whale culture. We are friends who are a voice for that culture. So it's, 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 it's not uh, difficult to be able to do what you have to do, like you would do for your brother and sister. You know, you so work. did you say we're not against any culture, we're for a culture? You well, know, I'm not, our, our, I'm our not definition against, of a culture is a little broader than yours. I'm not, I'm not against Japanese culture. I've been there. You know, I've been a couple of times in Japan. Admittedly, I was on anti-whaling missions, but I can see they've got a wonderful culture. I, I've, as an artist, I've also done ceramics sometimes. You know, I appreciate, I love Utamaro and Hiroshige and Hokusai and all that sort of stuff. I cut woodblock prints. And it's been inspired by Japanese uh, culture of art. So, you know, but one of the things you said before, and it's the way my mind works, is you said the black ink. You're talking about thinking the black ink. Well, it's funny you should say that because immediately I think of the cephalopods and that whole family of squid, octopi, octopi and, and, and um, cuttlefish. And I'm a huge fan of them. They're very, very intelligent beings and they have a massively fabulous language which we don't understand but it's it's as it's obviously as good as english or, or you know i mean human language and they have this highly developed eye and people say well but you only live you know cuttlefish only live for two years i mean what the hell they're not you can it's okay to come up for bait or whatever or this this idea of just keep on drying them out <laughs> to eat you know um but if you swim with them and also and if you know who they are I mean, I'm talking about heart, right? And you were saying about the black ink. They have four hearts. Cuttlefish have four hearts. Their blood is green because they're based in copper, not red. They're like alien to us, and we treat them like they're not worthy because they're so different. But they have this magnificent eye, and they have this incredible chromophore way of communicating with each other. And at the other end of the spectrum, if you like, in a way, the biggest heart on the planet, the whale. You know, when those two blue whales swam up to us, it wasn't just a big fish swimming up to us, so to speak, a big animal. This was a large woman swam up behind her large male partner, and she is the biggest woman on the planet, and she has the biggest heart on the planet. She has huge compassion. And a very important epiphany I had years ago when I was at an International Whaling Commission in 2000, and I was desecrating the Japanese flag, I thought, well, to be fair to Norway, to be fair to Japan, I better make sure I desecrate the Norwegian and the Iceland flag as well. And I went to a library to make sure I wasn't desecrating Sweden or Finland and got the, the flags right. And my girlfriend was looking in this encyclopedia, this is the days before internet, and 
walking away and she and she says, oh, look at that in this diagram of whale. Look how much bigger the heart is than the brain. And to me, this is an epiphany, and I've never seen this written down anywhere. This is my own thing of saying, there is the crux of the matter, is that here is a great race of people who keep forgiving us, who are super intelligent, who have huge brains, as good as seven times bigger than our brains, cerebral cortex, you know, much more complicated than us, and have abandoned war and all the rest of it by putting their hands inside mittens, have become great Tai Chi masters, great dancers of the ocean, you know, great singers, great lovers, biggest lovers on the planet, and deep thinkers and fantastic breathers. I mean, deeply and guarantee a whale doesn't get cabin fever. They're out there breathing solidly in deep pranic connection with, with the world. And here they are, the difference between us, we have a small brain, we have a, well, we have a brain smaller than we have a heart, a heart smaller than our brain. And we stand upright in gravity, pushing and pushing and stressing against to keep ourselves alive and, and alert and intelligent. Whales lie down in the sea with a heart that's bigger than their brain and oh, super oxygenated blood and a rotating in three-dimensional space supported by the sea. No need of transport, no need of shelter. The two things that we squabble about on this planet when you talk about you know, how we become like fighting ants is, is, is shelter and territory. It's two things the whales don't even have to deal with, you know. And when you look at when you look at them, you see how they are the finest extension of of our aspirations to do with compassion. They uphold all all those ideals back to us. They shine them back to us, our highest ideals, and we keep on falling short of our ideals, you know, the things we aspire to. Nobody ever told me that, you know. Nobody ever said these things that I've, I've ever heard about. more about whales. You know, that I've ever whales. heard about it. And they said, save the whales was just a good idea, right? And then who knows what, you know. And then now you're saying that uh, human society, you know, we could model after some things that whales are doing, right? Right. Like who they are. We could model, we could try it out. We could just test it, you know, and say, like, let's be a community where we just do some whale things, right? And like, um, Bar and Bay does by our something. heart, you know. <laughs> And, well, uh, exactly, and they and you have to when you like a friend of mine who works in Wales um, with Wales Alive, and he worked he was running an International Fund for Animal Welfare, the Asia Pacific area, a great mentor to me. He always says everything to do with whales is big, <laughs> and it's true. I mean, y you know, you are letting down the whales if you start falling into a place of small heartedness. You're letting down the whales if you start to to think that. Of violence might be an option to deal with something. It's not. Whales, whales. Well, you know, you can't really be big hearted and, and, and run a fight. You know, you can't even really be big hearted well, and go out and, and, uh, can't you? and, uh, and uh, block the, the whale killing, you know, because somehow you're out of your heart and no, you're not to do that. No, right? I see, that's where I disagree, and that's where this conversation is interesting. You take someone with Paul Watson, I see him as a man with one of the biggest hearts, one of the biggest hearted men I've ever met. And he has always been prepared to stand by his heart more than mm -hmm. his mind. It, look, look, all that Sea Shepherd is doing when they're blocking a whaling ship is doing the same thing that you or I would do if someone saw kicking, you saw someone kicking a puppy on the ground. You get in and you yeah. would block them. And you no, I'm not suggesting puppy. you shouldn't do it, you know, and I'm not suggesting it's a wrong move, but I'm just wondering, like, what can we compassion. do? It sounds like that, yeah. Okay, I'm just saying, well, what can we do with our heart? Just with that, you know, and then somehow Whoa. include this, you know, somehow the because the real heart connection is just kind of like what's left over when you stop fretting, and the heart is here already, right? When you stop fretting, because but if you say I have to go chase my heart, you're not going to find it because the whole idea of chasing it is like what's holding you away from it, right? You know, just just peeling away all these onion skins we've got around yeah. our hearts, you know, but. but just well, they're really the, not there. They're up in your head. They're, those they're, 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 they're all there in there, yeah. and then and then and then and that perceived necessity keeps you up there, kind of mulling it over, right? But when yeah. you don't feel a necessity, when you don't feel needy, then what's left over is your heart, right? And that's one way to enter into it. I don't know if there's another way, right? Oh, some other ways is is to is this we wake up and look at all of these beautiful sentient beings and and the, and the plant kingdom and everything and recognize where we are and who we're in the company of and stop obsessing about it's important wh what human company we're in it's really special that we're in the company of all these amazing animal and plant beings 
you know, and you were talking before, you know, plants can offer us great medicine. I mean, people are aware of ayahuasca, for example, to help people connect with the things that they need to connect with. And, you know, by the same token, when you're connecting with an animal, when you're open to seeing what that animal is actually communicating with you, or why you're meeting that animal in that moment, there's so much to be learning. And you do that through your heart, not through your head. You're, if, you're, if you're in heart connection with an animal, you're, 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 you're really recognizing that being for who they are, not diminishing them with your mind. Oh, it's just a, you know, it's a, you know, you're actually going through your heart. And then when you're there, then your mind can operate and go, how wonderful is this? This probably means this. You know, instead of being in fear about something, oh, this can mean this. And sharks is a great example. Yeah. How, how the world is starting to change their view slowly and too late to who sharks are. And we've totally misrepresented them and we've be- degraded them and we're slaughtering them. In the last minute that we've been spoken, another 200 sharks have been killed, you know, and 15,000 every hour. We're going to wipe sharks out off this planet. Humans are doggedly wiping out sharks without knowing who they are. But they've been here for 450 million years. And a shark could sit, if we were sitting underwater here with a shark, a shark could be reading us on all of our electrical impulses and and energies electrically and and in a way that we couldn't even dream of at the moment. And that's for real. And a dolphin would be in the room reading us with sonar and just telling us, you know, oh, isn't it, you've got a sort of a problem there in in the bottom of your spleen and, you know, there's something about there. You know, this is what a dolphin could do. So, and all animals offer that to us. And I've always had this opinion since I was a kid that that it's the great circle not of humans, not just the great circle of humans, the rainbow tribe, the whatever, the circle of industrialists, the circle of whoever these human circles are. It's circle circle of all the sentient beings. And we could have a tree in there as well, you know, representing to a plant kingdom. And and we stand in the middle and when we look around that circle of all these animals, we see an aspect of our humanness reflected back to us. That's all it is. So, you know, if you're looking at a monkey, the monkey's going to reflect, you know, mischievousness where we started this conversation, you know, tearing things apart, break it, and then see if you can put it back together. That's a typical male human aspect. If we're looking across, you know, at, 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 at dogs, or we might, we, might, we might see that aspect of ourselves, you know, that, that's sort of round the back alleyway trying to pick up something for free, or, you know, that we're trying, we're obsessing about sex all the time. or And, and when we look across at whale and we see huge compassion, massive intelligence joined together so that this whale is c- capable even seeing that person kill his wife will still be able to show restraint, incredible, you know, and uphold the ideals of compassion. And when we step out of that circle and a whale steps into that circle and looks around at everyone, whale sees aspects of his or her own personality reflected by all those other animals, even if you never met those animals. You know, one of the beautiful things about our connection between the two cultures of whale and and man is that it's not all and it's not whales are fabulous. We should all be whales. You can guarantee that dolphins look into our world and they see waterfalls falling down through jungles in the sea. And, oh, imagine eating spicy curried food. I mean, there would there'd be reasons why I'd hate to be a dolphin. You know, one of the great things of human culture is food. One of the things that binds us. I'd say two, the two, two of the greatest things that hold us together, apart from the joy that we can experience through love making and, and through helping each other, is, is food culture and music. And as far as I'm concerned, music is man's greatest achievement. It's the one thing we've achieved that's this unilateral language that makes us all laugh instantly, dance together, share and we don't need to know each other's languages. We can just share. And you can guarantee that, I'm sure of it, that whales look, could look into our world and go, oh, there's an overlap and we're ready to share. And we go into their world on that overlap and bring destruction most of the time. You know, Just bring terror to them. We've got a running a genocide ca- uh, agenda. Mm. When... Right in front of us are the greatest angels living right here, right here in our company. You know, that's how yeah. I feel. I really, really haven't heard it put this way, you know, and just to say this is planet C, not planet Earth, mm. is already a big jump. And then just to try to 
uh, expand on that and, and, and something has to be kind of like constructed to uh, some vehicle like a book written or something because like you can't really go see a whale not very many people can see one and if they do see one it's in captivity and that's not right either no it's not right and so then uh something about what we can learn from whales and how we can mm. really uh you know, whether it's even a, some kind of, it can't be what we can learn from whales scientifically, like uh, what we, we can document by about whales, you know, that's not it at all, but it We've should be. We've learned a lot from whales scientifically. The reason yeah. we have ultrasound, you know, when someone goes to get an ultrasound is because of research on dolphins mm -hmm. and, and that sort of thing. But they're sitting there with a, with a waiting to communicate with us, which is mostly telepathic. And yeah. we're, we're blocking that with, with, with an arrogant attitude of, well, just with our, our uh, with our documentation, you know, with our scientific attitude. Because like mm. we were just saying the other day in one of the conversations that we have quantum physics, but we don't have qua quantum physics, you know. In other words, mm. all our metrics are the quantities, yeah. the numbers, our mental, mentalization. But there's no quality f physics, you know. What's the quality? The metrics of science are not qualitative. Yeah. And so then... Uh, Okay, what could be done with whales and, and with an, other animals? You know, we could have meditation camps, or we could have telepathic camps, or we could have, you know, we can start to prove all these things that we uh, uh, allege, and and get uh, people really to share their experience and just say that they went into, you know, okay, we we do with plants, you know, and then we'd say have these drug things or drug experiences or spiritual experiences. Why don't we just do it with uh, whales? Well, that, that, that's the point I would make, is that in, in, the, in the communities that I am most comfortable with, the people who are fighting against animal abuse, the people who have a lot of, uh, feel deep connection with animals and spend time with animals, um, this is already an understanding. It's already an understanding that, this, that, that there are these stories and this ways of communication. I mean, look at the Faroese killing the pilot whales. They're called pilot whales because they used to bring sailors back from the sea to port. I mean, what a horrifically strange, mad, crazy thing to do is to kill pilot whales when you're a seafaring people. But this is how this is how out of tune humans can become, how separated they can become. And even though the name persists, <laughs> you can't yeah. even remember this. So, so instead instead of making it wrong, you do a study about it and just say like uh, the most out of touch place we're going to go to see really the, the disconnection that humans have. So we're going to do a study around this island. And, yeah, and well, just I've, you know, throw it up there like in big as big as big, you know, like you guys are a prize population because you're demonstrating like the, the one of the deepest sicknesses, uh, the mm -hmm. numbness of hu the human. But and they're very they're very hostile, of course, you know, to that. They would be very hostile that kind of thing. And of course, they would. We had a warship following us the whole time, and you know, at night we were dropping um, industrial smoke alarms at ten meters below the surface in each bay and setting them off with batteries that would last for six weeks and making this hideous noise to try and keep the pilot whales away from these islands because these idiots sitting out in the middle of the North Atlantic haven't embraced the whole heart thing of like how lucky are we to have this visit by these beautiful people our brothers and sisters living in the sea have created another strange totally irrational paradigm so that we have to come along and to dissuade those pilot whales from coming near the shore. It's a crazy thing. Like, you know, here it was like, oh, whale, come closer, come closer. You know, everyone wants to have that experience. So, yeah, it's just, it's just for some people, they're so shut down by culture because they're raised from young kids for this sort of thing that they're missing this great opportunity. And that's what I mean when I say there's opportunity. There's opportunity for people just to wake up. And even if it's a through shock, people would wake yeah. up. And I'd love to tell you a story. When we were in California, a very, very famous surfer called John Peck, he, he was a surfer of the day and surfed Banzai pipeline and so on in the early days in the 60s. He came and hung out with us. Now he's like a mystic. He's very much a mystic, long beard, long hair, and lives in a combi. And everything he said, said was just beautiful and you know, symbolic and mystical, and, and he came and he walked on our backs and he did body healing for us, you know, all of us surfers on the road. It was, we were a crew of 30 on the road. And uh, and he told a story one night, we were sitting on this fire at Dana Point down there at the Oceanic Institute, and uh, we were just done a big presentation. And um, he said that back in the day, if I've got the story completely right, 
he lost it in this big way. But yeah, he, well, when he was paddling out and he had his eyes underwater, you know, when you swim under the waves and you see the reef and you see all the sharks swimming all over the reef, you see all the reef sharks and you're saying, such a beautiful thing to see, you know, you just have that wonderment as you come over the reef and back up into the air. This is a wonderment that the whales live in and come up and surface and breathe. And he took off his wave and he broke something like two or three vertebrae in his neck and he felt paralysis overtake him in the sense that he would drown. But he had his eyes open underwater and he saw all the sharks go <laughs> and form a huge grouping in front of him on the reef and a message came to him straight away, do you need our help? And he immediately went, yes. And from the sharks came this huge jolt of energy that blasted him completely, took away all the paralysis, all the numbness, and he was able to get to the surface and swim back to shore and get ashore and lie there and say, don't touch me. I broke him back. And he, you know, he's, he's fine now. But the point that he was making was that, you know, sharks, 450 million years of pure finalized evolution who understand electricity, that point I made before, and just the realms of healing and sharing and knowledge hurled within the animal and the plant kingdom is phenomenal. And it's sitting there waiting for us just to be open to God, it. God, but that's where to go, right? Yeah. I mean, that's really where to go. Yeah. To these kind of stories and to these kind of proofs and to do, do testing and, and somehow convince some kind of uh, oceanographic scientist to go into this research or somebody, uh, something about, because we're, willing to try to research uh, life on uh, other planets or something. Why don't we just try to research life on this planet? We are, that is happening, but you, you know, it's still regarded as a small voice or even uh, an ex extreme edge voice to, to speak from the voice of plant kingdom or animal kingdom to represent in the way when what we pay, the problem we patently have is an investment in the machine. And the machine has been you know, being put in place everywhere and causing um, this uh, disruption and tearing up of the planet. So all we got is bio, and it's kind of like venturing into that is bioengineering, and that's more like just how we can get different uh, materials because they'll grow it like a shell or something like that. And, Every, and they got on, these carbons and stuff like that yeah. where they have strength more than steel and flexibility yeah, yeah. more than... You know, but that's all. But uh, to actually go into uh, something living and do some bioengineering or bio bio study that hasn't caught on yet. You're saying? Well, you know, it's like we still have to find those ways to communicate the language thing. I've had a dolphin telepathically say to me one time, "Do you mind?" Which meant, "Can you get out of the water?" Because I'm trying to get my kids into the river to sleep, but you know, and calm them down. And every time you're in the water, they're getting excited. You've already been in the water for seven hours, and I've had a, a big black kangaroo turn around at 3,000 feet in a high alpine forest way up the back of here, a wallaroo, which is an extremely rare animal to see, and a, a solitary lone type of kangaroo, huge, turn around, look at my father in the car, and I had this thought go through my head, remember where you are, and it just, it's powerful. When, it's, when something comes, a message comes to you from an animal, it's very powerful. I've had a humpback whale swim up to me and pick me up on her flipper with a baby on her head, the male singer, and she looked at me and she just imparted the most beautiful uh, compassion and well-being and everything towards me. And it was two days after a shark attack on a friend of mine that, that it, he had nearly died. And, you know, I've been talking about sharks, but I have to say that it was a situation where his fear, his fear reactions and stuff created the situation. But, you know, um, we've had these... I've had sharks circling me and and looking at me like curiosity rather than attack. I've had a shark, a shark and I hit, meet head on and both of us terrified. Oh my God, human. Oh my God, shark. And just running away from each other and then kind of standing off and kind of going, oh, that was a bit silly, wasn't it? So, you know, I've had sharks on my ankles, you know, back in the day when I was a fisherman before I was fully vegetarian, you know, uh, spearfishing fish for a, a village people in, 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 uh, in New Caledonia. And when I came out of the water, they said, how was it? And I said, oh, it was, it was fine. It was, but um, it was a bit odd. There were two sharks, and I had to put my foot on the head of the shark, you know, spinning in the water, throw the fish in the boat so the shark couldn't get the fish as it take him off spear. And I'd be hopping on one leg and holding the shark back <laughs> on the head with my bare foot, with this flipper. And they go, I said, yeah, there were these two white-tipped sharks that were right on my ankle the whole time. And they said, did you give them the first fish? And immediately I was like, oh, shame. Like, of course. 
You know, I said, yeah, we always give the sharks first fish. They're just the local dogs, right? And there's me going, shark, get the shark away. And, <laughs> and being in a sort of, not just letting go of the fear or the, or the, or the judgment and just go, well, I reckon the way they're acting, they want, the, they want a fish. <laughs> <laughs> and afterwards, it's like, you know, too simple. Howie, oh, yeah. it's been really terrific. I, I tell you, you can spin some tales that I really <laughs> want to hear and I want to really share. And I need to go. All right. Well, I would, I would just finish with a saying of mine because you know, this when I do speak, you know, on the, on the tours that Surface Felicitations does, or when I've been speaking as a support speaker with Paul Watson for Sea Shepherd, um, I have this simple little saying, which is, uh, well, perhaps I'll tell you a poem first. This is a poem called the sound of light and I used to write this on the back of all my whale paintings back in the 70s right through and I'll see if I can get it right it's life is the question waves are the key love is the answer kiss a whale for me the sound of light is where the sea meets the sand and while the whale lives waves of love are lapping on the land and while the elephant still roams free the land will still make love with the sea and that's my little <laughs> poem called the sound of light and then this other thing I'd like to say is, uh, I have this saying, which is humans living proof that God is still evolving, which is very relevant to this discussion. And, and then what I always generally finish off when I'm meeting with community speaking is the saying of mine, plenty of time to do, sorry, I'll start again. I finish with the saying, which goes, not enough time to do everything, plenty of time to do anything. Just enough time to do something. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Howie. Thank you, Richard. Okay. <laughs> hey, is there a website or something I should know about? Yeah, you can just you're welcome to tell people to come yeah. to, um, to transfer at Sea Voyage was the, was like the last thing we did. And there's footage of blue whales from the Arctic on that. That's at seavoyage.com. There's also music, 22 tracks recorded loaded in 22 days. Our main website is for C Global. That's our monitor, is for C, surface presentations, global.org, Sea Shepherd.org, Minds in the Water, with our new movie, which I've got to go to West Australia in a couple of weeks and do the premiere over there. We've been showing it all around the world. So it's standing ovation in the UK, mindsinthewater.com. It's a nice trailer at the moment. Um, and visualpetition.com is a thing we've started with um, 12,000 people so far uploaded from the system of one of those two. All its surf and community from Coast Bay to across from musicians like Michael Bain, Jeff Johnson, Ben Hack, all that. And then Chile, well, that, they're the main ones. Chilefeelzero8.com uh, is one that's been that surfing, but, oh, and I have my own beginning of a website called Harry. Thank you.